Today I'm going to report a little bit on our work on uh, resilient control systems in the Sparks project. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that a lot of people in the project who have contributed to this work, and I'd like to mention these people in particular. Um, so the outline of my talk is, is I will give a very brief background to, to uh, the, the problem setting. I think we've seen a lot of motivating ex examples already, so there's really no need to, to explain the background. Instead, I'd like to focus on two of the scenarios we've been working on. Uh, the first scenario is on low-level attacks uh, against uh, local controllers, and the second scenario is man-in-the-middle attacks against distributed energy uh, uh, resources. And in fact, the second scenario will be demonstrated to you uh, just directly after uh, my talk here. So it's a little bit of a teaser for that. So let's just jump into the uh, to motivation. So yeah, the smart grid is a cyber physical system and there's a tight integration between the IT and the physics. That's our main assumption. So I'm a control engineer, so I'm especially interested in the physical aspects because we're controlling the physics. So Traditional IT security is a necessary uh, measure to, to have security of these systems, but we've, we argue that you also need to take the physics into account. And how we do that, I will explain to you in, in this particular scenario. So, for instance, uh, we need tools and strategies to understand and mitigate the cyber physical attacks. And here are three types of questions we've been talking about in, in, uh, in Sparks. So, uh, what threat should we care more about? I think that's risk assessment. That was dealt with yesterday. Uh, today I will more talk about the, um, how to detect attacks in real time and also how to securely reconfigure the controllers to, to mitigate or at least so resilience in a way we would like the system to respond gracefully in, in, in uh, response to an attack. We will not completely eliminate the effect of them many times but we would like the system to behave at an acceptable level of performance also after an attack. That's, that's the goal here. Yes, those two last items here. So let's, let's jump straight into the, to the um, first scenario, which is then low-level attacks. So both scenarios, we use this uh, block diagram as, as, as an overview. So we have um, a physical system on the low level that we would like to, to control. It's a distributed physical system. Um, could be a power grid. It can be um, a, a temperature grid control system as it will be here in the concrete example. The main point is that there is a physical interaction between these local plants. Uh, there are local controllers, these could be PLCs or RTUs. They communicate over some SCADA system to a control center. That's the general topology we have for these type of systems. So con a co uh, hierarchical control system of the critical infrastructure. So, in the first scenario we considered, we assume that some of these uh, local controllers have been infected. Think about, for instance, a Stuxnet type of infection. The PLC have been corrupted. It's not performing the tasks that we think they should. Um, the point is, we then make an assumption that, um, let me see here if I can get this to, yes, so. Uh, the assumption that we make is that at least one of the local controls is okay. And it can communicate reliably to the control center. And this is where the physics is important because these are physically interacting systems. So if we have one okay measurement of the physics, we're still, with some knowledge of the physical system, we're still able to estimate what should be going on in these systems. So a person who is situated up here in the control center, in principle, should have a, a good idea of what should be happening down here. And that is what we will exploit now to, to obtain some sort of resilience. Of course, this, these are assumptions. If you violate these assumptions, what I say next may not be, be so relevant. But this is the general uh, uh, assumptions for the first scenario. Um, so what we have, the, the defense architecture we've been working on in, in, in Sparks is, uh, contains three, three different uh, um, processes. One is attack detection, which could be either uh, security information analytics or an intrusion detection system. Uh, we have one uh, task, which is um, attack isolation, try to figure out which components are actually corrupted. And then finally, we have a control reconfiguration, which responds then to, if we have identified certain components that are not trusted, how can we 
contain the problem. So those are the three tasks that we have uh, been considering. And these tasks can be uh, distributed in different ways in the system. And in response to this attack I just told you about, we decided to do the following. So we said that some of the local controllers are corrupted. We know at least one of them is OK. So what we did, did then was that we, we put the attack detection up in the control center, because at least some of the measurements we receive are OK. And we use security information analytics, and this is exactly where Neve's work comes in. She talked about it yesterday. So it's her tools are running up here, trying to identify, collecting all the data down here. We know at least some of it is OK, so we try to figure out which control loops are not OK. Uh, we use then that to try to figure out which one of these are not OK, and then we reconfigure the controllers here by overwriting these tasks, as I will show you in a, in a very specific example next. So this is the Nimbus microgrid. Uh, it's a temperature control system. We have a boiler and a heater here with local controllers, which turns on and off the boilers. And these were identified as particular sensitive or costly uh, for attacks. They would behave very badly. There would be a high price if they start to misbehave. So we assume that, suppose somebody would like to attack these uh, by manipulating the local PLCs, turning them on and off, and violating the safety temperature limits. So how could we detect that? Well, there's a thermal fluid running around in the buildings here, and if assuming at least one of these measurements in the temperature measurements is okay, we can, with knowledge of the thermal system, we can estimate what the temperature should be in the boilers, at least to some degree. And that information we can then use to try to detect if the boilers the boiler control system has been corrupted. So the attack scenario here is that an attacker has infected the PLCs that controls the CHP. Uh, we at the control center have access to a plant-wide me thermal measurements and we can use that then to detect uh, that there has been infection of these PLCs. Um, and the overall strategy, then this is basically the same picture again. We have on the top, we have the the distributed plant, which we control, which is then temperature controllers in the, in the building. We have local control loops turning on and off the, the, the thermostats. And we have a control center in the bottom here. So basically, the system data analytics collects all the data down here. It identifies that some of the measurements have been corrupted. What it does then is it uses its model of the physics to estimate, given now that some of these measurements are correct, what should then the, the true temperature be in that corrupted loop? And what it does then is basically that it overwrites the corrupted measurements. So it contacts the corrupted, uh, basically turn it off, the corrupted controller, and runs it over, over the network. Of course, this would not work as, as good as a well-working control system, but still it's better than running the system on a, contract, uh, a corrupted uh, control loop. So this is just to show how it works. Um, this is the temperatures in the, uh, the boiler header. The blue curve is the nominal when it's unattacked. Uh, uh, then the red curve here is what happens if somebody attacks the local PLC. Uh, you see then that it, you can drive the temperature to a different temperature. That could then be detected at the control center. If you look at the control center you have the plant-wide measurements and this can be identified. And you can then predict what the temperature should be and feed it back into the local controller. And this is just to show that you can drive the system back to, to the, um, uh, the blue curve then shows that you can drive it back to the normal performance, at least close to it if you have the system. So it's just a, 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 a way to illustrate that it, it works relatively well, at least in this simulation. Um, that was my, my, my first scenario. I'll jump to the, to the second one, which then is related to the demo. It's the same uh, overall architecture. Uh, the assumptions are different, though. So now we assume that the attacker is um, coming in at a higher level. Somehow he's uh, broken into the communication infrastructure between the control center and the local controllers. So this is a person who is interested in corrupting the commands being sent to the local controllers. But the, so he would like to steer the local controllers into an unwanted area. So in this case, the attack comes in here, not down here. 
In this case, we assume that the local controllers are not corrupted. There is no Stuxnet attack. So these are actually behaving nicely. So what we would like to do now is, just as the previous speaker said, we would like to introduce some sort of suspiciousness in the local controllers. They should not accept just any commands from above. They should at least think about it. Is, is this reasonable or not? And again, we have the same tasks as we have in scenario one. We have some sort of attack detection. We have some sort of trying task trying to identify which measurements are being or which commands are corrupted and we have some sort of reconfiguration response to it. In this case we distribute these tasks differently. Um, the resilience here uh, is down in the local controllers. Inside these controllers they would before they execute a command they will think about it. Is it really reasonable for me to change my set point or my control configuration? And we also put the um, attack detection now in a lower, lower level. We have a, an intrusion detection system that Bu Zhang talked about yesterday, which is actually in the communication network. It's not up in the control center. It would be unsuitable to put it there for these types of attacks. So what we have now is, um, what we have now is um, local suspicious controllers. And we have an intrusion detection system that the local controllers also can, can, uh, can uh, communicate with. This is the concrete scenario, which you will see much more in detail in the lab. Um, the um, control center, or should I say, the, con the systems we, we uh, look at are uh, photovoltaics on a low level distribution grid. They have a local uh, controller which controls the voltage level, and they control it by injecting or uh, injecting uh, reactive power. They can control the, the reactive power controller. Uh, they receive set points from the uh, control center to modify the voltage profile on the lines. And the scenario is now that somebody has hacked this communication grid and tries to overwrite the set points to basically steer the voltage profile of the line into some unwanted um, region. And there's now an intrusion detection system inside the system here that we can then communicate with. The, the PV systems can request information from the IDS, certain type of information. Um, and the idea here is, as I said, it's basically the system that Wu Zhang talked about yesterday. So what type of checks do we do in the PV system? What type of tests can we do? Well, we did something very simple. First of all, what we do is that we assume that the PV systems have some sort of anti-island anti -island uh, controller. It tries to estimate the, uh, the grid impedance. And basically, that grid impedance, it can use that to predict, if I execute the command I got, what's the new steady state voltage I should reach? That new steady state voltage, is, with, is it within limits or not? If it's outside the limits, maybe I shouldn't execute this command. Or at least I should send a warning up upwards in the system. That's the first test you can do. The second test is to just do some simple stability analysis. We use the Nyquist stability test to check Will I have local stability or not? How far away am I from a stability limit, the command I just received? And then finally, as I said, you could also communicate with the IDS. You could, for instance, receive warnings. To, for instance, you could get warnings of the type that there's been several, uh, several uh, communication packages in the grid that has contained uh, malicious types of data. You should be more cautious. Or, as I said, if one of these rules are violated, you could also send information up to the IDS, which could then use that to future, for future detection. And here's just to show the, the first rule. What we do is basically that the anti-eye landing system, you, you get a, a simple model of the power grid. You receive a set point. That's the command. The crossing point here is the predicted new voltage you would have if you implement that law. Is this within limits or not? If it's not, you basically don't execute it or you send a warning. That's the first simple test you can do locally. It's completely decentralized. Uh, the second test is that you can compute, to use the Nyquist stability test to check how high gain, the gain here basically is the slope, if you like, of this curve. If this slope is too high, you can get unwanted uh, oscillations, as you will see in the demo. And basically, you can quantify that limit by using the Nyquist stability test. You basically, what you need to find is the leftmost point of this Nyquist curve. So locally, you can compute this to get a limit that, if I get close to this limit, I should be concerned. 
And just to show you, uh, this is just uh, showing this. And this limit, of course, also depends on, on how many other units are being under attack. So this, again, is something that you could get information from, from the IDS. So here's just to show you quickly how, uh, how this plays out. Um, here's a case where um, if you implement a local gain that is higher than this threshold, and there's a small perturbation to the grid, you will see that the, the voltages start oscillating locally. So this was a bad, this was a bad control gain. You should not implement this. And indeed, it's above this critical gain. So the local controller should not really implement this type of gain if he gets that command. And if he, he, the gain was below that limit and you received the same type of perturbation, what would happen is that you would simply come back to, to the same steady state. So this was a better command to implement. It's not unsafe in this way. So it's a simple local decentralized rules that you can implement to, to check uh, whether, um, to, to check um, if the commands you receive from above are reasonable or not. So just to summarize what I've talked about is I show you two different scenarios where we basically implemented the same type of tasks in different ways. Um, of course, you need to di distribute these tasks depending on what the attack scenario is. Uh, and the goal here is to, to build on present day systems and basically build on top what is already there. Uh, and what's future work exactly? Right now we're working on these decentralized rules, uh, the stability tests, which uh, we want to be more adaptive than they are today, and I'll be happy to talk to people about it afterwards. Um, and as I said, in the Sparks demo, hopefully you will, you will see this type of, uh, this rule be implemented in the lab, and you will also see these oscillations uh, if you violate them. And by that, I'm, I'm done. Thank you.